Hey there, everyone, and welcome to the final bar. It's Tuesday, March 5th. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the chief market strategist here at StockCharts.com in a sunny Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close, particularly on a day like today. A little noisy, a little negative, although a bit of a bounce going into the close, but the damage had been done. The uh, major equity averages finishing lower, volatility pushing a little bit higher. Bitcoin teasing all-time highs and then dropping significantly soon after. We have a lot to, of uh, charts to review. Also, one of, uh, one of our best guests, Julius DeKempner of RG Research. I just presented with Julius last week in uh, Dubai. He is now safe home in uh, Amsterdam. He's going to be sharing some thoughts about rotation, some of the growth areas of the market that may be taking a bit of a pause. With that in mind, let's get right to our market recap. Talk about how the averages uh, drifted lower through the course of the day. Before we bring up the, uh, the uh, market data, I do want to share a poll question we had going uh, recently. Will March 2024 be a positive or negative month for the S&P 500? 57% of you more on the bearish side. Now, let's be clear, this is just for the month of March. And this is after January and February have had a pretty, uh, pretty strong move higher. But uh, over half of you saying uh, negative. I would probably have to agree. And I think it's, you know, again, if you, if you just purely look at the trend, and hopefully if you've taken one thing away from watching the show regularly, which I hope you do, uh, you know, as we talk about following trends, right, identifying those trends and following them. And I will tell you, one of the most uncomfortable places you can be in as an investor is selling when something's up like 20% and then sitting on the sidelines as it goes up another 200% after that. There's nothing worse than selling super early. So, Trend following is all about sticking with those trends that are working. And even with a day like today, arguably, the trends are still pretty positive. But given the run that we've had, would I assume we have another four-week stretch without some meaningful pullback? I would say highly unlikely. The question is, how quick is that pullback? How quickly do we recover? I would probably hazard a bet that uh, it'll be uh, a little longer than four weeks, uh, assuming March will be a down month. But uh, we'll have to see. And Friendly reminder, using a platform like Stock Charts is the best way to sort of answer that question through the course of the uh, month of March. Let's get here to our market recap and look at how things played out through the course of the day today. The Dow, the S&P, both down just over 1%. Now, the S&P was down to just below 50, 60, ended up bouncing a little bit going into the close, ended up just below 50, 79. The NASDAQ composite, even worse, down about 1.7%. It was down over 2% earlier in the afternoon, again, for late Late stage rally, last 30 minutes were a, a bit of a bounce higher, a little bit of buying going into the close. But again, overall, very much a distribution day after the S&P and the NASDAQ made new all-time highs yesterday. Mid caps and small caps all down as well, but not as much as the S&P or the NASDAQ, which led the way lower. And the VIX, the only uh, green color that you see on this uh, front page, VIX moved about a full point higher. So it was down on the 13, middle 13s yesterday, now up to a 14 handle, around 14 and a half. 15 is that level. I have an alert set for when the VIX spikes above 15. That alert did trigger. I actually was getting ready for the show. And here at 323, I have an alert. VIX crosses above 15. It did fire. I'm going to have to reset that one because it came down when the market rallied in the last uh, 30 minutes. That VIX got right back below 15. So, you know, VIX finishing the day above 15 would be the warning I would be uh, probably looking for. Looking at interest rates, for the most part, moving lower. You can see the long bond, the 10-year yield, the five-year note all moving lower. So the 10-year yield currently around 414, long bond yield around 428. And this is as uh, Fed Chair Powell is uh, presenting to a uh, congressional uh, panel, I think today and tomorrow, if I remember right. And again, this isn't an official Fed meeting that comes in a couple weeks, sort of in uh, late March. That'll be uh, the, uh, the second uh, Fed meeting of 2024. Certainly would assume that Republicans and Democrats both will be asking a lot of questions about interest rate policy, about inflation and uh, trying to understand plans for uh, the, uh, the Fed to uh, cut rates through the course of this year. It's interesting if you look at the futures market, if you look at where the market is pricing in, it's actually pricing in further and further until that first race cut. I'm actually hearing strategists that I uh, know and respect talking about zero rate cuts in 2024. Now, I find that at this point probably highly unlikely that we would get through the entire year with uh, remaining at this uh, current rate for the uh, Fed funds target rate. I would imagine we lower in June, July would be my guess, uh, but we'll see. I think the uh, the commentary this week, the next Fed meeting in March, certainly I, I would say highly unlikely we get a change there, but uh, hopefully get some clarity as to what rate cuts might look like through the course of uh, 2024. 
The dollar, no real change. We've talked uh, recently how the dollar index has been sort of a non-issue, right? The dollar's been relatively flat. Uh, if you look back in the last uh, last couple of months, not not much of a change, choppy but sort of sideways, and that continues today. Gold price is higher, about 0.6 percent up for the GLD. That's uh, putting us near $200 a share for that ETF. Silver actually down 0.9 percent, as I think I mentioned on yesterday's show. One of the uh, panelists on a on a panel that I moderated in Dubai was Mohammed El Said, who's a technical analyst at HC Brokerage in uh, in Cairo. And uh, he was mentioning how important silver was. He pays uh, more, pension, more attention to silver prices, thinking of it as a bit of a leading indicator. So I'm, uh, that's top of mind as I see gold slightly higher, but silver slightly lower today. Energy prices, for the most part, drifting lower, although the energy sector actually uh, did, uh, did pretty well. A lot of red in crypto land here, and some of these numbers are pretty negative in the double digits. Bitcoin currently down about 7%, call it 6.8% around 63,700. Now, in the last 24 hours, Bitcoin has been literally all over the place. We're, we're testing all-time highs around 69,000. We're plunging down to 60,000. We're almost having that and going back up towards 64,000. So as I've mentioned many times, if you love volatility, you're going to love the crypto space because there is a lot of it. Let's look at the 11 S&P sectors, only three of them finishing in the green today. Energy at the top of the list, up about three quarters of a percent. Consumer staples, one of the more defensive sectors I could name, uh, up about a quarter of a percent. The financial sector essentially flat from Monday's close. On the downside, two of the sectors are fangy, I guess is the way I would describe it. Technology leading the way lower, down two and a half percent. Real estate was number two and uh, consumer discretionary number three, both down about one and a quarter percent. Just to finish off here, I wanted to look at the uh, what we call the Magnificent Seven and Friends. These are uh, eight leading growth stocks. And again, there's such a big weight in our benchmarks. I think it's important to watch. I was noting uh, earlier today, about an hour ago, all of these were in the red. And it was from a little down to a lot down with Tesla le- leading the way lower. All, pretty much all of these bounce going into the close a little bit in the last 30 minutes. NVIDIA actually finished up in the green, up 0.9%. Everything else uh, down, Tesla down the most, down 4%. Microsoft and Apple, those are your two largest technology stocks, both down uh, just under 3%. So when you think about the XLK, it's really dominated by those two names. Those two stocks make up about 50% of the XLK. Those being down in a big way is certainly going to drag the technology sector uh, to, uh, to the downside. Let's look at a chart of the S&P 500, the daily chart, and see how things played out. Now, as you can probably guess, if you've been following uh, the show following my work, and here are the alerts that I mentioned that were triggered. Um, you know, we, we've talked about this green trend line, again, not as the world's most perfect trading system, but as a good visual representation of the pace of the trend. I've, I think trend lines are super valuable as a visual cue, right? It's a, it's, a, it's a conversation that you have with the chart. It's a conversation that you have with the markets. Those lines are a way that you note trends that you're seeing, you note key levels, you note movements that you're uh, expecting. And this is something that I really started to use more and more uh, from one of my analysts, Mark Dibble. Shout out to the team at Fidelity in uh, Boston. Mark's a, a longtime technical analyst there. Just a really thoughtful uh, and uh, knowledgeable technical analyst, uh, to be sure. And uh, he, would, he would draw tr- tons of trend lines on every chart he would ever have. And I asked him what he was doing early on, and he just talked about how that is his way of just analyzing. That's his way of visually showing, here's what I'm seeing, here's what I'm thinking. And then by saving those trend lines on your chart, you can have a record of your conversation over time and see when things are different. Because I would argue technical analysis, trend following, is all about defining a trend, identifying a trend, and then recognizing when conditions change. And on a day like today, you have to really separate the short-term shock, which is a 2% down move for the NASDAQ, and more of a big picture reflection of the fact that we're still making higher highs and higher lows. Now, uh, we have broken below this trend line. I think when you have a day like this, It's all about the next day. Do you get follow through? Do you get additional uh, selling uh, sort of coming down? On the very short term, what I would call the tactical time frame, I mean, immediately looking at sort of this level, right? This is the uh, most recent swing high. That's the high from early February. That has now become support here over the last week. We traded down. That's your intraday low for the day. That's around 50-50. Do we hold that, right? I mean, now that we've broken that initial trend line, do we break below that most recent uh, resistance, which has now become support? And again, this is a very short-term indicator. A bigger indicator that would tell me, okay, this is starting to be more of a corrective move where I really want to think about maybe taking some risk off, maybe getting uh, hedging some down, uh, you know, some long exposure with you know, uh, 
covered calls or uh, futures or inverse ETFs or some combination of all of the above. For me, it would be getting below the 50-day moving average. That's also this swing low uh, here from uh, mid-February. So that's around 4,900, 4,920. So I think you have downside to that level to still be within the context of, uh, of an uptrend. I also have to update these uh, Fibonacci levels uh, just because we did make a new, uh, new high. Whoops, that's not the line I wanted. Uh, new highs uh, yesterday. So I'm going to bump those up just slightly. So basically a 38.2% retracement of this most recent move will get us a downside objective right around 47.50, which is smack dab in the middle of this consolidation area. I think that's more of your kind of medium term, long term support. We hold that. And this is still, even though a painful short term move, long term is still OK. We break that. and I would be concerned about uh, downside exposure. And if you're if you're uh, or with long exposure and if you're uh, you know, if we get to that point and you haven't sort of unwound some long positions, I would certainly be rethinking risk versus reward given the potential or the growing possibility of uh, further downside there. Now, the QQQ, of course, just like the S&P 500 pulling back, the Q's uh, down uh, about 1.8%. Again, still making higher highs and higher lows. So the trend overall is, uh, is quite positive. We're still above an ascending 50-day moving average. I think the chart of the Q's, though, just the most clear bearish divergence that I've ever seen, where you're having higher highs in January, mid-February, now early March, and lower peaks in momentum. Now, the problem with that is we've seen that sort of move, right? If you look at the chart of India, we saw that in December and January and early February, right? Higher highs, weaker momentum. Price just keeps going higher. So I always have to remind you that, um, you know, a bearish momentum divergence like I think we're seeing here that's more of an early warning system. That tells you we may be nearing a top. Then I think you want to look for signs that that top is actually happening. What we've seen on India is we've not seen that breakdown. We've continued to see a pattern of higher highs and higher lows. The Qs has that same red flag. So I think you know certainly a, a probability, a high probability that we rotate lower given the fact that we're moving higher on weaker momentum. But I'm not seeing anything in terms of a trend change that would tell me uh, that things are really starting to, uh, to get ugly here. I do want to point out, looking at the Mindful Investor Live chart list, uh, the McClellan Oscillator, this is not going to be updated yet for today's close, but I would assume, given the strength of the downtrend and given the broad decline through the course of the day, I wouldn't be surprised if the McClellan Oscillator gets back below zero. That'll just continue this incredibly frustrating stretch where we're just chopping around the zero line. We're spending a day or two above or below and then reversing uh, right back. I think most of February was basically a noisy month for the McClellan Oscillator really speaks to a market in transition or a, uh, an uncertain uh, period. Even though the, the trends have been drifting higher, the breadth conditions have sort of stalled out here. I would say neutral on the tactical time frame. We get below zero and follow through. That usually means we're in some sort of pullback phase. Uh, so look to see if that continues uh, through the remainder of this week. I also want to point out the bullish percent index, which is another one of the breadth indicators I like to follow. Now, the bullish percent index ended the day still just slightly above 70. We highlighted that here. These red shaded areas are when the index, and I missed this one here, so sorry about that. But if you look at when the index gets above 70% and then back below, that usually sign signifies a pretty significant top. Now, we got that signal in mid-January. Didn't play out. The market actually just moved higher like it did not even care. Now we're back up into that overbought region above 70%. Look to see if we break below it. Now, that is, this is already updated for today's close. So we would have to see if through the remainder of this week you see further deterioration. But that could be maybe that secondary sell signal uh, and delaying the, uh, the negative pattern that we saw there. Let's look briefly at Bitcoin cryptocurrencies all in the red. We talked yesterday about uh, cryptocurrencies, uh, you know, just again, pushing to all time highs. Uh, you know, it's so funny. If you take a, a weekly chart of Bitcoin, you know, I... I, I, again, if you're surprised by what's happened here in the last 48 hours as we've accelerated to 69,000 and now have pulled immediately back from that level, I mean, this is just technical analysis 101, a significant high, an all-time high. It would be insane to expect a market to just blow through that level without some sort of recognition, some sort of sign. Someone somewhere is going to assume that that's resistance and is going to start taking that bet. And certainly that's what we've seen. So the weekly chart shows you how we have indeed 100% round trip from the uh, 2021 high to the 22 low. We're now all the way back up to that, uh, to that level. And if you look at the daily chart, you know, again, I tend to focus on the big round numbers. And so I was talking to uh, some of my premium members uh, earlier in the day at Market Misbehavior, 
we're doing our monthly chart review, which is a lot of fun that I do just for uh, the premium members. We talked about Bitcoin moving higher. My comment was, you know, given how extended this run is, I would be looking at big round numbers like 60,000 in this uh, sense. Because my, my general uh, sense when you have a, a something that's moved higher, if we're looking at like a stock or an ETF, I would say look for a pullback to an ascending 50-day moving average. That's sort of my go-to pullback level. The problem with things like Bitcoin is they've gone vertical. As a result, they're so far away from the 50-day moving average. Once we hit 69,000, this is another 20,000 points. That's about a 30% haircut just to get down to the 50-day, which seems unreasonable to me. So I would be looking at key big round numbers like 60,000. And sure enough, that's pretty much where we got to before bouncing higher. We're sort of in the middle there uh, around 63,500, we'll call it. Overall, I would say the structure and things like Bitcoin, just like the Qs and others, still bullish until we stop making higher highs and higher lows. And we've got a lot of room to go lower and still establish that higher low. I would argue around 50, 51,000, uh, which again is, is certainly quite a drop from current levels, but that's what the chart tells you given the strength of the run uh, off of, uh, or, or during this uh, recent period. Let's finish off just looking at some individual names. When we think about the Magnificent Seven stocks, think about these growth leadership names. Think about how much they have a weight in our benchmarks. How bullish do you want to be when Apple is breaking down in the way that it is? It hasn't just blown through its 200-day moving average. It's accelerating uh, to the downside. If you ask me what level to pay attention to, I think this is a clear uh, support level at the October low. That's right around 165. That's about five points below uh, where we finished the uh, day today, uh, down almost 3%. So overall, Apple in a bit of a free fall here, going lower. We're oversold yesterday. We're continuing to push that uh, lower here. I think we're nearing a potential support level. I wouldn't be you know, opposed to you know, betting on a, at least a bit of a reversal off of that uh, low. But at this point, we're seeing lower lows and lower highs. We're seeing a chart and a downtrend. Look at this, by the way, this January peak, when we rallied to retest and reattempt to break above uh, to new all-time highs on much lower momentum and the RSI stalled out around 60. That's very common in a bearish phase. And I think the market, uh, Apple topping out there with the RSI peaking around 60 is a really more bearish activity uh, than anything else. Microsoft, another one of these names uh, pulling down a little bit. Now that's your second uh, Apple and Microsoft, the two biggest names in the, uh, in the uh, technology sector. What's interesting about the chart of Microsoft, it's still kind of making a higher low, but it's really close to not doing so, right? We've now stalled out with resistance around 420. We've been unable to get above there uh, the remainder of the month of February. Now we're starting March with a bit of a pullback. The 50-day and the most recent swing low is right around 395 to 400. That's just below where we're at right now. So Microsoft is one down day away from breaking that 50-day, which is where we found support in January. Now a chart like this, pulling back but finding support at an ascending 50-day moving average, the RSI stopping above 40. That's a pretty bullish pullback within an uptrend. If we see something different, if we see a failure to hold the 50-day, we see the RSI go below 40, that might be a different read than we've seen recently on uh, Microsoft. To finish up our uh, recap of some of the weaker members of the, uh, of the Magnificent Seven, I would highlight this one. I don't know if I would label this a flag uh, pattern uh, just because it's not a perfect one, but it's not too bad, right? This is sort of a downtrend. I probably would call it a flag, to be honest, which is a downtrend, then a, um, an, a, a corrective move against the primary trend, higher highs, higher lows, pretty much a parallel move there. When we break the lower boundary, that is telling you that whatever move we had going in here is probably going to be continued uh, going down, which means, you know, it's basically suggesting, and I just crudely drew those, so please be more precise if you're going to draw these, draw these but, you know, basically means a return uh, to the April 23 lower, if not lower, uh, given the uh, deterioration there. So Tesla really not in a particularly constructive uh, move as well and suggesting maybe uh, further downside potential. It's not all bad, so I do want to highlight Target gapping higher. This is an earnings name today, up about 12%. Target's been drifting higher. Think about some of these big box retailers. They've actually been doing just fine. Uh, some of these names like uh, Target stand out to me uh, as uh, fairly strong charts. There's uh, Walmart. Uh, here's Costco. Some of the best charts you're going to find are in sort of those big box uh, retailers continuing to show strength. And also regional banks. Keep an eye on Keycore making a new swing high getting above resistance that's been plaguing this stock for the last uh, three months or so. Uh, here is, uh, what was the other one? Fifth Third, one of the biggest gainers in the S&P as well, up about 2.5%. So there are charts that are working. This is a good opportunity to use our scanning engine, find stocks 
that are making three month highs and dig through those charts. That's where you're gonna find things like Key and Fifth Third able to push higher even despite the uh, broader market weakness. We're gonna bring on today's guest, Julius DeKempener, here in a moment before we do so. Just one quick announcement, and that is to let us know when you have questions. We're gonna do a mailbag segment probably here in the next week. And as always, we'd love to feature one of your questions on our show. All the questions we've been featuring recently have been from people like you running into something about technical analysis, about market dynamics, about investor psychology, and emailing us their question. Email's the best, thefinalbar at stockcharts.com. X is fine too, at finalbarsctv. Just tag us in a comment there. And on YouTube, of course, make sure you subscribe. Join the over 100,000 people subscribed to our channel. And also drop a comment below the video you're watching in the comments section. We would love to hear from you. We hope to answer one of your questions in our next mailbag show. I want to welcome on today's guest, Julius DeKempener. Julius is the founder of RRG Research, a senior technical analyst here at StockCharts.com, coming to us from Amsterdam. Julius, last time I saw you was halfway around the world, you and your wife in uh, Dubai. Did you have a safe trip home? I did make it home safe and in one piece. So yes, it all went well. Thank you. So it was a pleasure. You and I got to uh, share the stage there for a little bit and talk about sort of a macro to micro process of, uh, of going through, looking at the RGs, looking at rotation, just thinking about how that informs your process, sort of big picture to small picture. You know, having come back now from this uh, CMT uh, summit in Dubai, what are your kind of key takeaways from that event? All right. So first of all, it was a fantastic event, um, a great venue, the Museum of the Future. I didn't even know it existed, but I was very impressed. It's a kind of modern style. Look it up on Google. It's, it's a fantastic building. And if you're in there, I always had the feeling that I was in like Star Trek Enterprise, you know, these, <laughs> these wide waffled walls and, and, and as clean as it gets. I mean, yeah. My God, it's it was impeccable. So that was fantastic. The uh, the crowd that the uh, CMTA brings together there was great. Um, I think just a little shy of 200 people, which I yeah. thought was very impressive for a first event in that area. Mm -hmm. So uh, so yeah, all good. And then um, uh, a ton of great speakers, got a ton of great people to meet um, uh, technical analysis lives in the neighborhood there lives in the in the area There's a lot of people practicing it yeah. Um, yeah so from a high level overview I was very impressed and I, uh, I had a really great time absolutely it was interesting we talked uh, I mean we had a number of panels a number of discussions through the course of the two days and uh, you know I, I picked up sort of a general bullishness I think a lot of us sort of in that trend following camp you know, hard to deny that we're seeing strength in the markets overall. And that sort of medium term, long term picture certainly seems constructive. It's interesting today you're coming on the show as the Nasdaq sort of leading the way down, down about 2% today. What do you make, sir? How do you sort of uh, think about what happens on a day like today within the context of the larger trends we've been observing? Yeah, I try. that's exactly what I try to do. I try to position it and, and, and you know, basically take a step back and say, okay, so what does this really mean? Is this really, has there been serious damage done to the chart? And, and mm. so far, if I'm looking at it right now, I, I have to say no. I mean, it's a bit, it's, it's a bit of a decline, but, you know, in the, in the bigger scheme of things, uh, Mark's been up massively since October, but also, you know, since, since, you know, the little sideways move that we had in, um, in January, yeah, and then we we used that as a bouncing board and moved higher, and now we've got that we got that dip down, but we're still above the previous low. We're still above the previous high. That is a, a bit of a, a form of support, uh, form of resistance. Now getting into support area. Yeah. Higher highs, higher lows, still in play. I don't know. So you know, looking at the chart, right? I'm not sure how is when when things happen tomorrow, but you know. At this point in time, I have to say that we're resting at support. Trend is still going higher. Everything is in place. So I don't think any major damage has been done to the chart today. Yeah. You know, this, it's, only, it's only two days into the week, so there's more to come. But, yeah. but so far, so good. It, it's hard to be too bearish when we're one day off of a new all-time high for the S&P. So let's be clear. We're not far off the, uh, off the peak. Uh, we'll see what comes to the remainder this week. Now, you and I were talking before we started the show about rotation and again what you and I did in Dubai which was a lot of fun was just sort of going through this process of using different RRG graphs different relative rotation graphs to think about 
uh, rotation on different, uh, you know, different uh, levels from the high level asset classes to individual stocks. When you're looking at the 11 S&P sectors, what stands out to you, uh, again, given the conditions we're at here in uh, early March? Yeah, so um, first of all, from a seasonal point of view, March is actually not a bad bad month. Hmm. You know, it's, uh, we're starting a uh, pretty positive season from a seasonal perspective. So that, that plays a role in my, in my thinking uh, that I should not be too bearish in this period of, in this time of the year. Yeah. Um, when you look at this RRG here, which is the cap weighted uh, RRG that pretty much everybody looks at. Um, and it's it, immediately, it's also the problem that it is the most looked at and it is the cap weighted because it's a little bit distorted now. And we've got only one sector moving into the leading quadrant, and that's communication services, Axel C, um, <clears throat> which obviously is dominated by a number of uh, mega cap stocks in there. Uh, and if you, you don't have to bring that chart up right now, but uh, large cap growth has been the name of the game over the last weeks, if not mm. months. And obviously, a couple of the names in Axel C are. Um, very dominant in that group of large cap stocks. And if you bring up the equal weight version of this group of sectors, then you will find communication services inside the lagging quadrant and moving lower. Uh, and I'd say, you know, I'm going to say this is a very rough estimate, but like 80, 85% of the time, the tails of the equal weight and the cap weighted are in the same rough area with the same rough direction. Right. Um, and in this case, that is definitely not the case. You see a very clear difference between the two. And, and what that tells me is that that sector right now is only driven by a couple of very large names in that sector. Under the hood, that communication services sector is not doing too well. Um, so that's that's one of the observations that I'm keeping an eye on, uh, and and you know again these are the large cap growth names Meta, Netflix, um, what have you. Uh, if, if you bring up the um, the, the members, well, we can see them. Um, yeah, Disney, for example, Netflix, Meta, Disney. Those are the ones that are inside leading and moving higher. Obviously, mm. that's the bulk of the cap capitalization of that sector. And look at all these other tails moving the other way. Um, so very clearly under the hood, that communication, se communication services sector is losing some of its uh, shine, uh, if not for those three names. And if you go back to the cap weighted and the equal weighted, you will find that a lot of the other sectors are moving in the same, in the same area. If you, mm. if you go to the equal weight, you can see that they are more equally spread and you will see healthcare insight leading, you will see uh, probably industrials in there. Um, and uh, discretionary is the one that I think that is, uh, that is rolling over down there. Yep. But it's a, it's a much more evenly spread universe than the cap weighted. Gives a little bit better idea and guidance of what's happening in the broader market, uh, so to say. Um, coming back to the narrative or the rationale or whatever we want to call it on the S&P itself and the market. One of the things that I'd like to, uh, to look at is the rotation of the defensive sectors. Mm. So when a market, when, when, the, when the market is really moving into defense, so if you see money flowing into defense and that is traditionally healthcare staples and utilities, um, that is something that, that, um, Puts a, puts a red flag for me because that means that investors are shifting their money to the defensive areas of the market. And mm. on, on this daily chart, uh, sorry, this weekly chart here, that is not happening yeah. uh, yet. Uh, if you bring up the daily, um, yep, then you will see that it, it is even... Um, it is even, well, uh, I'm not sure whether I call it worse or better, but um, they're, they're clearly ro rotating out of favor. So you've got utilities mm. inside improving, rolling over. You've got staples with a very clear rotation um, the other way. And then we have um, uh, staples, utilities, healthcare. Uh, healthcare is right there. Yeah. So that, that is all 
mm. moving on a negative RG heading, basically indicating that money is flowing out of these sectors. Now, obviously, that, that didn't really impact the change of today. But again, stepping back, the conclusion, I think, is that there is not a very clear rotation into defense. And if the market is going to sell off, if we're going to see a bit more of a corrective move or a decline, you have to have money moving into defense. Yeah, it's not happening. It's not happening yet. So, what would be sort it. of that red flag indication that tells you things are really getting uh, uncomfortable? And that it's not just a one day thing, but something something deeper. No, is, it, it, is it a rotation of more defense, or is there something else that would sort of tell you, okay, hold on, this might be a lot worse than I would expect? The rotation to defense is sort of the uh, canary in the coal mine. You know, that is that is very often I've I've seen it over the last five years, a few times when in the run up to to, you know, markets rolling over or getting weaker. Every time you see under the hood, you see that rotation to defense. Um, and I can't I, I don't have any kind of real numeric uh, backing for that. Yeah. But, you know, I've seen it over and over and. It's interesting that the the rotation into defense seems to happen earlier before the rotation out of offense. Mm -hmm. um, that is a it's a again. I probably need to do a little bit more work and see if I can find some some statistical evidence or you know ev evidence based proof of that. But so far, my from my observation. Um, I have sort of picked up this kind of rule that, you know, it first you see the move to defense, then you see the move out of, and it's a different move. This, they don't move together. You mm. see, first you see the move into defense, and then the market can still be, uh, even could even be going higher. I remember um, before the last big uh, rotation down in 2022, so at the end of 2021, when that, real peak was going to come in yeah there was a super clear rotation in deep into defense but the market was moving higher which was kind of special because <laughs> you saw the market moving higher um carried by defensive stocks so there was so much money moving into defense that it was enough to actually keep to keep the s&p higher and then obviously you know that all started to roll over and fall apart. But that for me was a very interesting uh, point in time when you very clearly saw first rotation to defense. And then when that is sort of exhausted, you see the money starting to really move out of offensive and sensitive stocks. Yeah, so the first thing to look for, maybe outperformance from some of those defensive sectors. And I 100% agree, utilities, even real estate, these are sectors that are still underperforming. So we'll keep a watchful eye and see if we start to see a turn higher in some of those defensive areas of the market. Julius, so good to see you and your wife, Misha, in, uh, in Dubai. Glad you made it home safe. And I'll look forward to talking to you again soon. All right. Yeah. And uh, be careful with that photographic evidence. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. That's Julius no, DeCumpeter. <laughs> Julius is the uh, founder of RRG Research and a senior technical analyst here at stockcharts.com coming to us from Amsterdam. I think great points there on the RRG. And again, it was really fun. We had a lot of fun on the stage there talking about big picture to small picture, macro to micro. And I love how with the RRG on stock charts, you can have a bunch of predefined groups that Julius has uh, handpicked to really think about cap weighted sectors, the normal ETFs you think about, equal weighted sectors, really thinking about that market cap effect on things like technology, uh, consumer discretionary communication services, very top heavy sectors, and then breaking down an individual sector by looking at the components within the S&P. Do that sort of thing consistently. You will not miss the next big rotation to the upside. Great take there, as always, by Julius DeKempner of RG Research. Folks, we've got to wrap the show and go to the three in three, three charts in three minutes that tell the story of this market environment. Here's chart number one. The QQQ moving higher, as we mentioned in our market recap, charts like India, the Qs, Japan, the S&P, so many making higher highs and higher lows to say nothing of the AI stocks, NVIDIA, AMD, SMCI, and others. Divergences have often been a great way of identifying potential trend exhaustion. That is a general observation. When a market is going higher, you tend to have improved momentum. 
when the market keeps going higher on weaker momentum. It's not a guarantee of a market top, but it basically tells you this, this uh, car is running out of gas, the train is running out of steam, whatever analogy you think uh, tells this story well, it's kind of happening. So I'm concerned by the queues making higher highs in January, February, and now March on weaker momentum. Now, as I showed you in the market recap, India has, did that uh, in January and February made another new all-time high. So it's not a guarantee that that trend is going to stop, but it definitely tells me to anticipate a potential downside move and look for signs of a reversal. Now, with something like the queues, a day like today, while painful for one day, still is within the context of a primary uptrend. I don't think you could say that we've seen enough yet telling us that that primary uptrend has changed. But a lot of these charts have a pretty clear level at which you might see a further deterioration or might confirm that that was indeed a market top. I'm concerned by charts like Microsoft and Apple and others that have already broken down. It feels like the queues uh, are still going up, but other names, even members of the NASDAQ 100, not looking as rosy. Chart number two is Bitcoin. I mentioned our market recap, the uh, uh, Bitcoin, you know, basically testing an all-time high, pulling back very, very quickly. I wanted to show you an hourly chart. We don't show a lot of hourly charts uh, on the show because it's a little too short term. But I think especially when you have a market that is moving very suddenly and swiftly in a small period of time, hourly charts can be really, really helpful, even if you're more of a long term investor, because it helps you just understand the dynamics at work on those lower level time frames. So if you look at an hourly chart of Bitcoin, take the low from February 26, take the high, which we just achieved here in the last 24 hours, 60 or excuse me, 38.2 percent of the way down is around 62 uh, 240, 50% of the way down is right around 60,000. Uh, That's that big round number that I mentioned. So on the daily chart, I focus on those big round numbers. On the hourly chart, doing it with some Fibonacci retracement just to anticipate some levels at which you might expect a short-term bounce. For now, it appears that that 50% level kind of is, uh, has been tested and for now held. I think 60,000 is the level. As long as we hold that level, this is just a pullback within the context of a volatile but strong uptrend. Finally, the regional banks uh, ETF, ticker KRE, the two uh, ETFs uh, that I like to follow, the S&P sort of group, uh, industry spiders are KBE, which is the banking ETF, KRE, which are the regional banking ETFs. We mentioned uh, KeyBank, Fifth Third, there are others I could mention like Comerica, uh, which were in some of the, uh, the best performing charts today in the S&P 500. The KRE was up over 4%. Now what's interesting here, taking a quick Fibonacci analysis from the May 23 low from the December 23 high, 38.2% of the way down is around 46.24. You can see that lines up pretty well with that low in February. So for me, that's your support level, right? Right around 46, 46 and a quarter. For now, we're holding. And today, maybe that's a springboard back above. Let's see if we can get it back above the 50-day moving average. But there's your downside risk, your upside reward, maybe to retest uh, the swing high. Not a bad setup. And in a sector, financials, which have not been performing relatively well because of the dominance of those growth stocks. Look at some of those undervalued areas, as uh, my guest today, Julius de Kempner, uh, implied. See where the rotation is happening, and the proof is always in the price. Folks, that's a wrap for the show. I want to thank you so much for joining us every weekday after the close for the final bar. Special thank you to Julius de Kempner, jet lagged and all, joining us from Amsterdam. Don't forget to like this video, subscribe to our channel so you won't miss the next show. For Stock Charts in Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be well, stay safe, have a good night.